Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 192 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with David Park. Uh, D behind, behind the screen here producing. And our guest on the show is Chad Michael Collins, an actor best known for the Call of Duty franchise and the Sniper series of films. Really excited to have you on the show. Chad, thank you for joining us tonight. Much respect, gentlemen. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, from one pretend soldier to the real deal. Uh, <laughs> always a pleasure to uh, to speak to uh, men, of, men of your ilk. Well, well, yeah, thank you. Thanks for doing it. Uh, like I, I was saying earlier, I, I think there's a lot of crossover between our audience and people who play Call of Duty for sure. Uh, so, And be prepared because Jack and I are both former snipers, so we're going to test your knowledge as the show goes on. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty lost. Here it comes. Yeah. Uh, no, so, so, Chad, if you could start off just telling us a little bit about your upbringing. I read that you grew up in upstate New York and, and kind of like what your pathway was that took you towards acting. I had a really, really roundabout way uh, into into acting. Um, I did. I grew up in upstate New York, outside of um, Albany, a little a town about forty miles outside of the state's capital in central New York. There, um, you know, twenty five hundred people max. So it was wonderful. You know, it was a small, small school, small town. You know, baseball, basketball, football, the all-American diet of, of, of sports and, um, you know, just being outdoors, you know, sun comes up, you're outdoors, sun goes down, it's dinner time, get in, get inside kind of thing. So hunting, fishing, Boy Scouts, all that sort of stuff all the way through, um, which was great, you know, and I, I was the first kid in my immediate family to go to college and figure that whole mess out and i ended up going to ithaca college in uh upstate new york as well below below syracuse close to rochester and um i found my my way a journalism degree found my way out to los angeles doing some internships out there and fell in with a uh, hollywood publicist and uh after i did the old cap and gown walk i i landed there as an assistant and three four years into my journey in la i i was exposed to so much in the entertainment industry um, you know, I started taking some acting classes and, you know, was very, very casual about it for a while. And it wasn't until, uh, they decided to do the, um, the uh, sniper franchise to bring that back around and reboot it. I, uh, was lucky enough to be able to play the lead role in that. And it did well enough that they made a bunch more and that kind of, uh, set me off in a dedicated fashion towards the acting career and out of the, uh, existential hell of an office. So, so uh, uh, I mean, but that doesn't just happen, right? I mean, you audition. Were you? Did you have your? Or did it just happen? Did somebody go, "Hey, we're going to reboot the Sniper franchise," and you look like you'd be, you look like a sniper, a young Tom Berenger, as it were? Honestly, that's that's literally what I heard. Um, but <laughs> but the the the, the missing piece of that puzzle is I I was fortunate enough to book a lead role in a movie called Lake Placid Two. Uh huh. Uh, that I filmed over in Bulgaria with with John Schneider. If there's any Dukes of Hazard here uh, oh, yeah. fans like I was growing up, uh, he played my pops, uh -huh. and Clovis Leachman was in it. Who's a co comedic legend, and we went over to Bulgaria and shot this low budget sequel to to Lake Placid. And uh, I was lead role, and the producer of that, uh, he's the one that wanted to lift the Sniper franchise back off the ground, get it off the shelves, reboot it. He uh, saw me as a young Tom Berenger funny enough and he he wanted to do a uh kind of a reboot where it was focused on vietnam flashbacks i'd play a young behringer uh doing that part of the the movie that that idea got scrapped and they they made me uh his son so uh brandon beckett you know uh, son of the legendary marine sniper thomas beckett so uh the rest is history seven movies later i've been a part of and 10 total in the franchise it's been uh it's been very very good to me so it doesn't just happen but sometimes Beautiful circumstances line up, and if you play the long game, uh, good things can can come from it. That's fantastic. Now, were you a fan of the of the sniper film, like growing up? You know. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I TBS and TNT when we finally got cable, which wasn't until I was in high school. 
um you know they're always playing movies like roadhouse they play the original sniper i remember watching all these movies uh as a kid and i'll wow. never forget that opening scene from sniper where it's just this this shot on foliage and all of a sudden snipe you know the helicopter helo is coming down and it's rough you know rustling all the fauna and behringer just kind of climbs up out of nowhere in a ghillie suit it just it, such a deep impact because i was also obsessed with gi joes uh, -huh. uh i had a lot of family in the military and in police departments and stuff like that too all throughout my my family so uh much respect and much appreciation for it growing up and just you know fascinated with with soldiers and and stuff like that yeah i mean i will say that jack and i are both also big fans of of the franchise of the first movie i mean it was you know i was a little bit older than jack probably when we first saw it but but it was still it was like a formative movie for us i i, I, I was probably like 11 or 12 renting it on vhs tape and uh I, I yeah i wanted to ask you about the original film because i remember watching it as a kid and just being overwhelmed by how cool tom berenger was in that movie crawling around a ghillie suit with all this like field craft and everything and it was like that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to be that guy. Yeah. I, I love that movie. Obviously platoon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I, when I got out to LA, you know, what I was really just watching over and over and over again was band of brothers mm -hmm. and obviously saving private Ryan is a movie that I love. Um, but band of brothers, I was just watching it over and over and over again. And that's, that's when people started playing the seed about, uh, Hey, you ever taken an acting class before? And I'm like, you know what? If I could run around being a, a fake GI Joe at any point in my life, like this might be something really fun to do as a hobby, because I just I love it so much. Uh, so, yeah, I, I all those movies left an indelible impression upon me, and I've always been obsessed with uh, that life and that lifestyle. And uh, here we are, you know, doing it uh, the pretend way. <laughs> Still, <laughs> I mean it it's great though. It's entertaining. Like, you know, you don't want a bunch of, you don't want to see like the real thing. It just sucks ass. <laughs> like nobody, nobody would watch that show. Like laying in the prone in a belly hide for like 16 hours. With the sun yeah. beating down on you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, not a great movie. Now for when you got that role, what was there? Obviously you have the script and you know, I'm sure the script was looked over by like, you know, technical advisors and things like that. But did you do your own research? Like, how did you get into that role in particular? Oh, absolutely. You know, I started watching documentaries. I, I remember reading um, the books about Carlos Hathcock, mm -hmm. um, you know, who I think Behringer's original character was sort of modeled after um, uh, that that elite sniper. I believe it was the Vietnam era. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was doing all that sort of stuff. You know, there's some wonderful documentaries that you know, took you all the way through sniper school and everything else. And, you know, it just blew my mind because, you know, I don't know much about the elite branches of, of the military, but, you know, snipers are such thinking men soldiers, mm -hmm. you know, and it, 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 it's been a great fit because, you know, there's, there's your, you know, grunt types. And then there's, you know, the, the soldiers who have more going on behind the eyes. And I feel like that's, that's something that, was a part of what I brought, you know, in terms of the essence of myself as an actor. So it couldn't have been a better uh, fit and a more fascinating, you know, character to play or to to learn about and prepare for. So, you know, luckily I don't have to hit broadside of a barn with anything. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, that yeah. saved me that embarrassment. But uh, at the same, it's just fascinating to learn, you know. And, and you two can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I was I remember reading about the washout rate. For, for sniper school being so high amongst the highest of all the uh, military branches and the elite forces. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a challenging course and, and it's not just the shooting aspect uh, because you can train anybody really to, to shoot to, you know, the like a, a one mil difficult. standard, but it's like you say, it's a thinking man's game and you know, it's getting in and then getting out after you make that shot. Like you want right. to make the shot, but then you'd also like to leave the objective alive. Um, yes. And, and, you know, and I, I, I will say this because I know actors have said it before um, and have gotten, you know, kind of beat down for it. But acting is a very difficult job. And I imagine that acting as a sniper, you may not know what it's like to be in a hide for 16 hours, 
But when you have to do take after take and you are in a ghillie suit, which I, you know, and things like that, uh, like I, I've done a little bit of acting and I know how it's like repetitive over and over until they get the right thing. So they want to get different angles or whatever. It's, it's not a, it's not as easy as you guys make it look. Is it <laughs> right? Uh, you know, it's really, you know, what do they say? Embrace the suck. And, yeah. you know, I, I embraced the suck of an office for 15 years, so I didn't care if they were going to try to kill me on a Bulgarian mountaintop with a 35 pound 50 cal. I didn't care. I was right. like, this is amazing. You know, and, <laughs> and, you know, but you never, you, you never lose the perspective of what it takes for someone to do this in real life. And right. that keeps you very humble. And for that reason, I, you know, ego very much in check and wanting to be able to pick the brains of technical advisors uh, and anyone who has that experience and know-how is very crucial. You know, n not all actors do that. Um, but I, I just thought that, you know, representing servicemen and women, you know, is is a kind of a duty and a responsibility uh, in your own right. And so, you know, there's certain things you have to give up when you're filming because shots don't look great if you try to be 100% technically accurate. And I'm right. like... Sometimes we know we're 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 getting a shot, and because of the framing, we're going to take some grief. Right, uh, but that's Hollywood filmmaking for you. Right, <laughs> right. Because, like you said, you know, it's not always glamorous what you guys do for real, um, and it doesn't always make for the most sexy or exciting series of shots. Right. Uh, so you kind of have to fudge thing for the cinematic uh, <laughs> effect, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it but it is something that uh, I've always taken seriously. I've been very grateful to be able to do and. You know, hopefully I, I pull it off uh, in my pretend half-assed way. So we we think so. The uh, tell us about uh, Sniper Reloaded. This was the the sort of like reboot of the franchise. Your your kind of break on the series. I believe you filmed in South Africa with mm -hmm. Billy Zane, uh, yep. who is also in the original film. Can you tell us what what that experience was like? Yeah, up to that point, I was, I don't know, I was more of like a hobbyist, you know, I was, I was writing, I was working in public relations, you know, I was exploring a little bit of like freelance writing and journalism on the side. So I wasn't really sure, you know, I was always able to treat acting like, um, you know, just like a part time hobby that I that I happen to enjoy. And when I could invest in that side of, you know, the career and the hustle and be brave enough to do an audition, uh, it was a lot of fun, but I, I never thought it would be a real thing or, or a long term thing. Uh, but when this movie came around and, you know, I, I arrived in because we, we filmed outside of Joburg, uh, Johannesburg in South Africa, which is amazing, uh, just completely majestic, so much wildlife. We were shooting on nature preserves, with all sorts of exotic creatures running around at all times. And of course, I got to meet Billy Zane, who, you know, who hasn't grown up with with Billy Zane's movies. And, and right. I don't know anyone who's not a fan of Billy Zane. So that right. was really <laughs> Uh, a super special for me. And I remember after that experience, um, I was like, this is it, you know, and, and I, I got to go all in on this. This is, this is the biggest adventure of my life. This is the most fun I've ever had. And if I don't see this 110%, it'll be a lifelong regret. So that that's the one that kicked off not only our um, sniper franchise, which is still going strong, but um, you know, really helped me decide to turn the corner Mm -hmm. into pursuing a full-time acting career. That's fantastic. Out of curiosity, um, because you mentioned that, you know, there are some shots you have that you need that, you know, a, 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 per a tactical person is going to look at and go, well, that's not how they do it. But, yeah. but for the shot, you need it. It's the same, like right. when they do the shows with divers, it's always a, a, a face plate like this big. So you can see the actor's face because nobody wants to see, you know, the actor, just the actor's eyes or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. So how does that work? And I'm sure it's different on different movies, but how does that work between like a director and the writer and the, the technical advisors who are going, this isn't how it's done or you, you should do it this way. Is there give and take, or is it pretty much the director and the, the DP, like th they, you know, they have their vision and that's how it's going to happen. Yeah, and the, you know, you, you see that happen a lot because obviously someone who's lived it and breathed it, a technical advisor, that's their job is to tell you what's accurate, what's not. But at the same time, you've got producers and a DP and you've got lighting and, you know, you've got all sorts of artificial factors, you know, right. to make the most entertaining movie you can. So sometimes there is 
that friction and hopefully there can be a compromise where everyone wins but not always yeah you know just yeah. you know for instance sometimes with framing you know it's something's called a hero shot they want the hero to seem bigger than life you know superman so the camera is going to be coming up under you well if you've got your head buried against the stop right. piece from the side to catch the shell ejection your face is covered so it doesn't make a great shot so you kind of have to cheat it yeah it's not accurate at all yeah. <laughs> and people let you know it's not right, right. It's just that thing that the director just has to be like you know we just have to eat it on this right. one right get the shot so that's funny you know, it, do you ever get not hate mail but do you ever get like people who are like i love your movie but this scene like it's not accurate you should have done it honestly yeah. it's rarer than you think and yeah. and i you know i'm grateful for that because it means on whatever low budget we have, we're getting something right. And, you know, if it passes the sniff test with people who really live it, that's what you want. You know, yeah. you want them to enjoy it uh, and you want it to be passable so, to the point where they're not rolling their eyes or screaming epithets at their screen uh, right. at you. So, and so it's very rare uh, that those come. They have come once in a while, but for the most part, I find that um, the people in the military community are incredibly supportive and, and very entertained by them and enjoy them. So I'm really, really grateful for that because first and foremost, um, you know, you want to make them happy, you know, as well as an audience worldwide. Sure. So, you know, we, we certainly do our best. So you did a pretty good job on Sniper Reloaded and they had you back for Sniper Legacy where you get teamed up with, it's the return of Tom Berenger to the series. So father and son uh, in, in the film. Uh, what, what was that experience like for you coming back to it? Well, that was fantastic just because, you know, working with Billy was was amazing. And he came back and did a few more with us. Uh, but, you know, Tom's a legend in his own right. And I grew up on all his movies, every, you know, including the original Sniper movie, as we discussed. But, you know, things like Platoon and Major League and Big <laughs> Chill, all sorts of stuff, you yeah. know. And so, you know, it, it's for, for an actor. And I was really young and, and somewhat inexperienced at that time to be able to work with somebody who's you know, Oscar nominee. He was just coming off winning Emmys for Hatfields and McCoys with uh, Kevin Costner. So to be able to work with an actor of that pedigree and that caliber and being humble enough to just be a sponge uh, was really a, a fantastic experience for me. And, and Tom's a great guy and really, you know, you, it, all due respect, you know, it, it was his franchise, you know, he's, he's the guy. <laughs> so even though they're kind of passing the torch to you, you know, really, it's, um, you know, wanting to collaborate and follow his lead on a lot of stuff. And uh, it was a really great experience to kind of meet one of your, you know, acting heroes in that way. So and we got we got to do a bunch together, which I'm grateful for. So you had already done like Placid 2 and then uh, and then you did the first, you know, the the um, Sniper Reload did reload. Did was it like like Placid 2 was it the first Sniper movie? The second like when did you say this is what I do? It was definitely after uh, Sniper Reloaded in South Africa. You know, I'm flying halfway around the world. I mean, it, it was surreal. You know, yeah. it was my first business class flight. I'm like, well, I don't even know what it is. It was like Virgin, right? So I'm, right. I'm in LAX in the Virgin Lounge because you're allowed to go in some sort of fancy right. waiting, you know, palace. And so I'm in there and I'm like, you know, with my tiny little Nokia garbage phone. It's like 2010. <laughs> And I'm like calling my my mom before I get on the plane, you know, to go to, you know, London Heathrow and then all the way down to South Africa, M massive travel day. And and I, I hear uh, just a really like modest voice uh, say, excuse me, you know, is anyone sitting here? And, you know, meaning the seat across from me at this little table. I was all the way at the far end of this lounge. And I look up at Slash from Guns N' Roses. I'm like, what is my life right now? <laughs> uh, and not, like, what are my guitar heroes? So it just, it was, it was unbelievable experience from start to finish. And that, that was definitely the light bulb film for me where I just like, it was just dream come true, you know, to, to have, you know, idolizing movies like this on the screen and being by such fans of them. And then it just didn't sink in until I was done that I was, I just, I just did this. I'm a part of this, this world now. And so I really just went all in and I was, you know, putting my 50, 60 hours in a week at the office and just doing everything I could to, to keep building the acting career until it had its own legs, its own uh, bipod legs, as you could say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jokes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, so about seven, eight years ago, I was able to really 
uh, turn the corner full time into into acting and, and lucky enough to keep doing it. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I got lots more sniper questions, but I got to give a quick shout out to the sponsor for this show. Uh, you'll like this one. Battling Blades. This company makes all sorts of. Uh, I would. I don't even want to call them props for for. They're films, replicas. But they're actually they, yeah they, replicas. Yeah. Um, basically, any era, any blade, swords, knives, hatchets, uh, tomahawks, amazing stuff. They also uh, have amazing dice sets for you tabletop role players out there. Um, you see this dragon with these very cool, um, I think they're milled dice. Um, they have great stuff for people who are into cosplay, into LARPing, and into just dressing up for the occasion, whatever that occasion may be. So please check out BattlingBlades.com. Use the promo code TEAMHOUSE to get 20% off your order. It's BattlingBlades.com, and the promo code is TEAMHOUSE. you get 20% off your order. And, uh, oh, by the way, please like and subscribe to uh, this channel, and uh, check out our Patreon, which is right down below, if you want to get this uh, show ad-free. Um, so anyway, back to you, Chad. Uh, Hold on. Yes. We're not moving on until I comment on that sword. <laughs> that, was, that was giving me serious... Serious snake eyes feels. Yeah, there, that that's all it is. Yeah, it's, a, it's a katana. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. That's a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And we, you don't we, have to. We were, before the show, we were geeking out about dice and Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. So no, they they have, have great collectibles. Dice. Jack has pulled this on on occasions, and and I may or may not have gotten a close shave. So we try to keep <laughs> it. <laughs> Should have been playing with it when we're sitting around drinking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, how you have a negligent discharge. So, I uh, sniper reloaded sniper legacy. At what point does Call of Duty come up on your radar? Uh, yeah. So that was like, um, so we released Call of Duty at the tail end of 2019. Um, and we had been working on that for on and off for about a year and a half, okay. uh, filming, filming those things intermittently for about a year and a half solid. So that, I guess that puts us at what, 2017 into 2018 when I got rolling on that. But, um, you know, video games are, you know, on, on major lockdown for actors. They don't tell you what the game is. You don't know any of the people associated with it. Wow. Um, they give you as very few details as possible. Um, you know, once that process got going, I was able to kind of put some context clues together and just be like, I, I think this is what this is. But, you know, me and the principal cast, we didn't get we didn't we didn't have the curtain pulled back until we were on day one of shooting. Wow. Uh, where we all got to meet each other for the first time and, and learn that it was a a soft reboot of modern warfare, which uh, I love those games. I remember yeah. playing that trilogy back in the day. So we were all just kids in a candy store, you know, me in particular, because I've been a gamer my whole life. So it was um, it, it was really incredible to find out that's what it was, because, you know, it was an audition I did with a director and the writer and, and whatever else. And then you don't hear anything for two months. And then all of a sudden it's like he's hired. I'm like, oh, great. What am I hired for? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like, still it's like working you. at Area 51 or something like what? the yeah. <laughs> Where am I going? What am I doing? Right. Is that because they don't want you like pulling a Tom Holland and like spoiling everything before it gets released? I think that's the thing. I mean, you know, if you you guys understand the video game space, and if you play Call of Duty at all, it's like everyone is hunting for leaks. Yeah. Everyone's got theories about what's coming up next and when and whatever else. So it's really uh, nothing is safe and nothing is sacred if people get a little taste of a <laughs> rumor. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's for our own good. I think it's for their good as well so that the, uh, the internet doesn't go, uh, bonkers with, with any sort of a uh, slip like Tom <laughs> Holland style. Correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, for a call of duty, you're doing a motion capture acting. Yeah. When I did call of duty it was a full, uh, motion capture performance capture. So we had, um, you know, the full suits on and everything else. And we had, um, you know, a close up camera, like a helmet rig that, so it was full face capture as oh, well. Wow. And of course they got the voice. So it was a full spectrum head to toe, you know, that, that character was me and I was that character, except they added a really sweet mustache, which was, I'm super grateful for. <laughs> so challenged up here, sadly, but, um, Alex, uh, is my character in call of duty and and uh, and it was it was a pleasure for me because I thought they played it great because Modern Warfare, the original trilogy, was is beloved and it's and it's it's amongst the favorites of all the Call of Duty players. 
And so I think that they found a sweet spot between paying homage to the old guard and introducing some new characters and storylines. So there was a bit of a hybrid and not just a hard reboot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really love that. And I got um, to originate this Alex character, who's basically the only American uh, outside of our boss, you know, which was really cool to play like a, a hero operator that was uh, American and, and representative of our uh, our our great military tradition here as well so that was it was a real honor and a, and a real pleasure so uh it was a really fun adventure great people and um yeah the proof was in the pudding we shattered a bunch of records which were recently broken by modern warfare 2 but um people seem to really love it critically and commercially so that's that's what you want were uh how did you find the motion capture acting was that like pretty uh, that must have been like a new and different type of challenge for you yeah, I had dinked and dunked on a couple of games before, but none as intensive and that rigorous uh, as doing all those uh, those shoot dates um, in there. Yeah, I mean, you're wearing spandex covered in Velcro, so you know that that creates logistical challenges for bathroom breaks and everything else. But uh, <laughs> you know, it was it was interesting because you know you got these helmet cams, you know these these face helmet rigs where uh, a super close up camera is like extended a foot foot and a half out from your face so you have to be aware of that as well when you're interacting with other actors not to tangle up your thing you know i i, I guess it might be like a, you know an unfortunate kid who has to have headgear for braces and stuff but it was like that times a thousand so it, it all took a lot of adjustments and the video game space is very different because they're always they're always filming you in a big wide master shot but then you also have the extreme close-up because of the um the helmet rig camera so I, I, my co-star, Barry Sloan, who came from the theater world, he plays Captain Price, phenomenal actor who did such a great job with that character. Uh, he kind of likened it to, you know, it's film meets theater in a way that the, it's like two worlds and two shooting styles converged into one where movement becomes very important, but also so do the subtle micro expressions because you got a camera right up in that mug. Yes, like you can't get, it sounds like maybe you can't get away with anything either because everything is being recorded all the time. Well, they these, you know, motion capture, performance capture studios um, and, and the wonderful people at Infinity War, the technology is unbelievable, but we had, you know, 360, like just rigs everywhere. There was like, I think they said 75 to 95 cameras. So they're catch they're capturing you from every single possible angle at all times. So from from action to cut, there can't be a flubbed line and there can't be, you know, you accidentally putting your hand through an imaginary chopper, you know, <laughs> or anything like that. So the rehearsal days become really key because it does feel like kind of like a stage play production and that everything has to be, you know, technically perfect uh, all the way through because there is no editing that not like a, not like a film, you know, and, and, you know, doing the sniper movies. If you're ejecting a blank in, in a jams, it's like, it's no problem. Keep the cameras rolling. Let's just do another one. We'll edit around it. That doesn't happen in the video game space. So it's a very different kind of acting and preparation. Now, in between like the snipers, like leading up to it and then in between them, like you've done quite a bit of TV too, right? Do you? Yeah. And, um, you know, <laughs> look, I, I, I'm reminded of the old, uh, Peter Falk, the old actor who played Columbo, and he just talked about typecasting and how, you know, so many actors hate getting pigeonholed into playing this type of character over and over. He says it's the best thing in the world. You'll always work. Right. So I've been very lucky in television to be able to, you know, work on shows like Blue Bloods, you know, playing a, a former Marine with PTSD and, uh, you know, NCIS, NCIS New Orleans, you know. So the, the MacGyver, where I played a fighter pilot, you know, it's really been a lot of fun for me to just keep, uh, uh, playing those pretend soldiers, agents, you know, stuff like this, cops, you know, and all these sorts of shows. It's really been a, a fun part of my brand and how people see me. And I've been very fortunate to play those roles quite a bit. And that that's a lot of my TV work uh, as well. And it, it is fun to step outside the box, but I'm always excited and I never get tired of the opportunity to uh, play a pretend soldier. And so you, you got to do that again, Sniper Ghost Shooter uh, with Billy Zane and then Sniper Ultimate Kill uh, down in Columbia filmed with uh, Billy Zane and Tom Berenger together. Um, at this point, you keep getting called back for these films and they keep getting made. You, you must be really realizing it, it's like, your series. This, now, right? Yeah, this is the thing. Yeah, you know, I really in a way, I guess, yes, but. The way I come up through it and the way I, I, you know, experience those movies myself, it's it's hard to 
you know, kind of own that for myself. You know, I, I, I'm still just extremely grateful because, yeah. you know, I lived a different life and acting was never anything that I, I had set my hopes and dreams around. I didn't go to Juilliard. I didn't go to NYU. I didn't, you know, do any of this sort of stuff. So every day feels like a blessing. You know, I'm yeah. very humble. And I'm very grateful for the journey. So to own that is, is, you know, a little bit tough for me to do because so many greats came before me and uh, established this franchise far, far before we came along, but we're doing something right. You know, we have Sniper 10 coming out this summer. Um, you know, we just, it, our last movie, Sniper Rogue Mission, we released it in the US in August. We had a great run on a DVD, Blu-ray, video on demand release. And then Netflix premiered it for us in December after most people in America probably already saw it. And it, we, we stayed in the top 10 list and Netflix most watch movies for like nine days. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, want, I wanted to ask you about that, Chad, because, um, you know, some of the sniper films, at least I found like, they're kind of difficult to find or they were like, you had to kind of go out looking for them, right? You had to know they're out there and go look for them on, you could find them on Amazon, but to see them like pop on Netflix was really interesting. And I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, getting onto the top 10 on Amazon, is that like getting onto the top 10 of, or I'm sorry, getting onto the top 10 of Netflix. Is that similar to like, if you're an author getting onto the top 10 on Amazon, like that's a pretty big deal, right? I, to me, it blows my mind. And this has been happening for years. Like I, and the fans around the world are, are, are amazing and all yeah. credit to them. They're the ones loving this, watching it, circulating it. And I have, I, I have so much love for them all around the world, but, but they also keep me in the know. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I don't know when the sniper <laughs> movies are releasing around the world in different territories ever, but uh, they seem to track this, love this, always let me know when it's hitting number one in their countries. And, you know, just the other day we, I, I you know, they released Sniper Ghost Shooter, which was, I think, 2016 or 15 or something like that. It debu debuted in like all these new territories all around the world and like went to number one. And, and our, a movie that was eight or nine years old is the fourth most watched movie on Netflix in the world. You That's know? amazing. And it's, just, it's amazing. Yeah. You know? and so, yeah. yeah. It, and it's, it's been such a blessing and the fans around the world are great and, and, and they love these movies. And, and I hope we keep making them forever. I, I mean, I'll, I'll say from our perspective, it's a testament to the franchise and and a testament to you as an actor that uh, th this franchise is now 10 deep. Like how many movie franchises can go 10 deep and still maintain its fan base like that? I mean- Yeah, I, and we, you know, yeah. our, our, our budget is what Vin Diesel and the Fast and Furious people get like, you know, for a day's worth of catering. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> right. So it's, it's nice to be uh, having the longevity that is usually reserved for the the bigger budget uh, major studio franchises and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, that's what blows my mind about Netflix is, you know, we're, we're competing and taking down Netflix original movies that have never been seen before, where they have invested tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars into their films. So uh, it really is. Uh, we're always just blown away. You know, and and so, but you know, every time we go and try to make something a little bit better, a little bit uniquer, mm -hmm. and um, you know, like I said, we, we must be doing something right. And you know, it, it's I, fans around the world, and I, I don't know. Uh, obviously, you, you two are probably really world traveled from of your your experiences and and your background, but I just know that there is a fascination and there's a deep respect maybe all around the world for the american military you know it's such a storied legendary tradition over here um that is the response and feedback i get you know from international fans all over the place you know it's just like that all american soldier and what that represents and i i just think that the fans around the world really love to hear those stories and really love to watch those movies and uh hopefully we can we can bring you know all the way up to sniper 70 Eight. Great. Uh, you know, when, when 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 you're passing it on to your to your son, right? Exactly. And yeah. Grandson. Yeah. Everything else. Yeah. No, I uh, no, I, I I thought it was interesting you bring that up because yeah, you're you guys haven't been afraid to do something a little bit different w with each film, which keeps it fresh, you know, and you're not making the same movie over and over again. Um, after uh, Ultimate Kill, there's Assassin's End. And this is sort of, I wanted to ask you about a, a sort of like where the franchise is going. And, uh, and Assassin's End introduces uh, Lady Death, played by Sayaka Akimoto, and uh, Ryan Robbins playing Zero. 
and it mm -hmm. I start get the getting the feeling around here that you're starting to build up your superhero team, right? You're starting to put the team together. Yeah, you know that that movie was um, that introduced those two characters. Uh, obviously, Lady Death becomes an adversary, but if you watch into Sniper Rogue Mission, she becomes an ally, mm -hmm. and um, you know doesn't stop kicking my butt ever. So uh, it's nice to have her on your side, as they say, uh, when you can't beat them, make them join you. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, right. but yeah, that was kind of, um, and I think it's really wonderful because you know all credit to our producer at Sony, Daniel, and Oliver Thompson, who kind of came in with the trilogy vision within the franchise and that kicked off with sniper assassin's end which he wrote and produced and then he directed the last two the one the uh, rogue mission and the one coming out this summer sniper 10 uh where he really wanted to put a team together you know because if you watch the old sniper movies you know tom might come back billy might come back but there's a cast of supporting characters teammates spotters etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but, you know, we don't often see them come back, you know, unless it's Dennis Haysburg. Dennis Haysburg has come back and we've we've formed this new team called GRIT, uh, which is an acronym, um, Global Response and Intelligence Team. And that was set up after the last movie. And yeah. so I, it's really fun. And it's very different to have that team dynamic where the gang keeps getting back together and you get to explore those comedic moments. You get to explore the way that they fight together, the way they balance each other out in their styles. Uh, so that's really, really been fantastic. And I think the, the response has been really good for that as well. As somebody who started out as a writer, and I know it was, you know, journalism and not fiction writing, but do you get an opportunity to exercise those muscles on these shows? Have you ever kind of gone through your own creative process with them and, and had a chance to sit down and, and do that? Uh, you know, they, they do it on their own mostly. And I, you know, I come from the school of, of acting where, uh, unless it's really going to add value or, or, or unless it's like a redundancy they didn't catch or, you know, if there's something I just feel really strongly about, I mostly just try to make the writer's words work always mm -hmm. because they put a lot more blood, sweat and tears into those words. Usually mm -hmm. uh, you hope at least right, uh, right. than I ever could. Right. So, you know, I, I do follow my instincts and my intuition. You know, we're really lucky in that a lot of people we work with, especially these sniper films are incredibly collaborative. So, if there is an opportunity to make something better, but it's got to be something better. And I've seen a lot of actors fall into the trap where no matter what, they just want to make their characters cool. Right. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make necessarily for a better scene or a better story or a better product. And so you kind of have to have that humility of, you know, knowing that um, you got character arcs and layers and whatever else. It's not about your character always shining and being, being cool and changing the words to reflect that. So I try my hardest to honor the words on the page, uh, especially when you start to get into technical stuff like uh, military things and, and whatnot. So it is rare. I know the door is open. I try not to do that. Uh, there's certainly been instances where I where I have, but that's just kind of my rule of thumb in terms of, uh, of that. And I've seen way too many actors go way too far with... <laughs> Rolling pages right out the window. Just because <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's not in the. Uh, I know you guys didn't say this, but I'm adopted, so this isn't how the my character my character is adopted. So this isn't how they would act. Whatever, right? They yeah. create a, an elaborate backstory and then want everything to. What about what about your own sort of screenwriter? Have you ever like thought about that? You know, you're obviously a creative person. You know, you play D and D. You, you, you know, you have and you do have a background in writing. Do you have you ever thought about pursuing screenwriting on your own? Yeah, producing is something that um, you know I, I'd want to step into more. Uh, it's just you know, filmmaking is a fascinating process. I, I just feel like every part of the productions that I've, I've been a part of is it's just a, it's a miracle coming yeah. together, it's moving parts and how long it takes. And, and all the ways things could go wrong and, and everyone coming together to make sure that it gets past the finish line. So uh, it's something I've, I'm fascinated with. I'm always trying to learn more. I've got a lot of projects in in development. I've, I've given my hand at writing a little bit, um, you know, rewrites and stuff like that. But uh, I think it's fun. I think it's a door that'll be open for me later. Um, you know, my whole thing is I, I like to, I'd like to have a broader perspective and broader education on it all. And then hopefully kind of find my niche in there, you know, and whether that on the road that's directing or whether that's writing. Um, but, you know, one thing at a time to really yeah. appreciate more 
process from from that point of view. So, you know, I've tried my hand at it. I like to think I've made some things better. Uh, but, you know, those things aren't made. So we don't have the, <laughs> the proper <laughs> feedback. Yet, so. Right. Right. And what about like your own technical training? Is that something that you sort of pursued once you realized that you were in these films? I mean, have you have you had a chance to shoot much? Is it something that you're interested in or not interested in? I love it, you know, and I, I have always tried to add extra training uh, where I can in there. You know, these the, the the budgets are a little bit lower. And of course, there's like liability issues and whatnot. So, right. you know, we, we we don't really get to go to a range. You know, we don't we don't get a little boot camp. We don't get a week of basic, you know, right. to, to sniper movies. You know, we have great technical advisors. We always have. Um, so I've always taken it upon myself to try and uh, you know, educate myself, add to my training and my experience and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, you, you don't always necessarily have to because right. of what they ask you to do in these films, but for my own edification, you know, and, and I grew up and I'm very comfortable around firearms. It's, it's always been something I was, I was taught to respect and, and have much appreciation for and, and, um, use safely. Um, you know, there's still actors on set who, just wave things around and you're like, Oh boy, you, know, that's, that's just, you just hate to see it, you know, yeah. because that's the number one rule. And, and, um, but you know, it's, it's gotten safer in the fact that VFX have come so far that, um, you know, back in the day, even shooting blanks, you know, quarter loads, half loads was the norm, especially if you're going over to Bulgaria where there are no restrictions on anything. Right. Right. Uh, but now it's it's really about uh, a lot of painting it in with VFX and the in post production uh, as a much safer way to go about go about doing that. So you know it adds an extra layer of what you're responsible for as an actor in terms of recoil and kick. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Not closing your eyes when you shoot, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I, but I do I I, I do try to um, you know get out and shoot when I can. I do try to add to some training when I can. And uh, not not as much as I like, and probably not as much as I I should be doing. But you know, in Los Angeles, it's not as sure. easy. It used to be going in my backyard and shooting crab apples out of the creek. Right, right. So you uh, did a pretty good job, you know, laying out you know how Rogue Mission ends. But I want to see what details I can pry out of you about <laughs> Sniper Ten. We've arrived at that point of the interview. What can you tell us? I gotta be honest. You know, we're, we, we, for the first time ever, Sony was like, tell people we're doing another one. And I was like, oh my God, really? Because I usually had to keep it quiet for, mm -hmm. you know, eight, nine months until, you know, through shooting until the release. So um, it's no secret that we, you know, we, we shot last fall. Um, you know, the, the, the grit team is back in action. Dennis Haysbert and, and Lady Death and Agent Zero and of course, Brandon. Um, you know, we were, we were overseas in Malta filming that one, which is really, really cool. It's a very different type of movie with very different types of locations. Uh, I really love this experience. That's cool. And I think people are going to love it even more than Rogue Mission. It's really fun. And, uh, you know, I, I think we made something special. I can't say too many of the details outside of that, other than that, uh, probably this summer is when we will, uh, we'll see a drop. Okay. I, I love Malta as a setting. That's, that's super cool and different. Yeah, what a fantastic little place. Such history. Uh, it's just completely unique through, through and through. So uh, a really, really great experience being there for five weeks, filming that, taking in that culture, but also, you know, I mean, like Gladiator was shot there, and Game of Thrones, like you name it. So to be on those same lots and uh, using those set pieces that they were for, for things was really, you know, made made, made my nerd heart sing. <laughs> Let, uh, oh, go ahead, Jack. Oh, well, well, no, the, the other, other thing I was going to ask you about is the future of Call of Duty, which I know you're like sworn to secrecy and they will like waterboard you if you divulge any <laughs> secrets. But um, is, is there anything you can tell us about, you know, sort of your future maybe with with the franchise? Um, Yeah, you know, it was a big surprise to me, as it always is. Uh, and this is why the fans are the best, because they they are the first to know and they always let me know, which is I'm very grateful for. Uh, but in mid-December, you know, my, my phone started blowing up one day and I'm like, what is, what is even going on? I started getting tagged and all this stuff and whatever, uh, apparently in this new game mode, uh, called raid, which is like a three person team you put together to solve puzzles and unlock the next piece of the storyline. Uh, but like captain price, Farah and Gaz, who I started with in modern warfare, uh, they are on a mission because, uh, Alex, 
is apparently lost somewhere in some underground tunnels and stuff like that. So uh, Raid Season 1 kind of put Alex's mug back on the radar uh, in an intel briefing where, where is he? Is he alive? Is he dead? You know, you're going to have to navigate this as a player to go and see what happened to Alex and what the hell is even going on. So that was a really nice surprise, uh, a, a teaser. And so that's going to be season by season. You know, in season two of the raid, we might unlock another piece of the puzzle to see, you know, where in the where in the world is Alex San Diego. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. There's a chance we might see you. Samsonite, I'm saying there's a chance. <laughs> And uh, and you said that you just uh, you finished uh, recently when you're off another movie, like a totally different genre now, right? Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't sniping anything there. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, Lionsgate just released this movie we filmed in the Caribbean. You know, coming off of 2020, it was a pretty pretty lean, dark, quiet year for about every actor I know around the world. But 2021. Uh, we got back in business and I was fortunate to go to the Caribbean, the island of Nevis, a beautiful island uh, connected to St. Kitts. And uh, we filmed a, we filmed a rom-com, which is really fun. I don't always get a chance to do those things. And so I had long hair, you know, just totally looking like a poor man's Patrick Swayze running around <laughs> the beach. And uh, <laughs> I got to play, you know, kind of some hunky dude who mostly just... You know, I was living the island life down there. It was just absolutely beautiful. And and just in like, you know, surf trunks and no shirt because I'm, I'm in paradise. And so yeah. that was actually what was required for the character, which was uh, fantastic. So it was really my <laughs> my days and my shooting days were not much different, actually. So uh, but it was fun. It was a really lighthearted uh, romantic comedy just got released by Lionsgate, I think, on all you know VOD platforms. They might do like a Blu-ray release or something like that later on. But uh, I play a character called Harry, who's not just a beach hunk. He's there's more than meets the eye. He's the thinking man's beach hunk. <laughs> nice, you know, just like snipers and thinking man's soldiers. So right. uh, it, it was a real pleasure and a lot of fun and a total departure for me, uh, where I didn't have to take out one hostile. Spoiler alert. It's uh, we'll look forward to it. I, I actually really enjoy rom coms. Um, I'm a big rom com fan, but you uh, you mentioned like geeking out. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about what we see in the background going on because we know you're a big D&D fan. We see the Funko Pop, like, uh, I don't know what the series down in the right It's probably your left corner of your bookshelf is there, but how, like, when did you get into Dungeons and Dragons role playing stuff like that? I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I don't know if we're allowed to see the, the P word, but um, you can say it global panty uh, when it happened. It was wonderful for my D&D habit. I'll be honest. I had a whole year where I logged so many hundreds of hours of D&D. It was it was incredible. It was a silver lining and an otherwise very precarious uh, year. Twenty twenty. Yeah. Yeah. I've always been a nerd. I grew up on comics. We were talking before yep. we went live. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, the Marvel universe image, I was in, you know, eighth grade when image, when all the best artists and oh, yeah. writers from the comic world went and started their own company and did spawn. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. it's just all over it. I played magic, the gathering. I, I, you know, I grew up on Nintendo, super Nintendo, you know, Zelda, final fantasy, and I, you know, and I got hooked on like Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. And, and so I, I was, you know, it was just weird. I lived a really weird existence because I, you know, I'd go to like football practice and then I'd go meet my dork friends at the library and play Magic the Gathering. So it was like, <laughs> I was just always had a foot in both worlds and I'm, I'm still that way uh, to this day. But yeah, I, it's hard to tame my collection. of. That, that's not nerd. going back in the closet. <laughs> no, it's. I mean, look, I got the Warzone posters behind me, yeah. you know, represent. But then, you know, I've got a Conan and Red Sonya back there. I've got all sorts of D and D stuff. I got my comic, comic hardcover collections down there somewhere too. And you know, and and shout out to Battle Blades, you know. But one of my favorite movies is uh, Braveheart, and so mm -hmm. I've got a uh, a wonderful guy named John who was kind enough to send me a, a little replica like pen opener, you know, William Wallace Claymore. So <laughs> I cool. really tried not to buy the full length things because I'd have it what looks like an armory behind me. But yeah, I don't know that I can hold out much longer, especially <laughs> if they're uh, snake eye swords. 
Yeah, dude. I uh, same thing for me, man. When 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 it hit, uh, I played so many hours and hours on uh, fantasy grounds with my friends. It was awesome. Awesome, oh, man. It was really. I, I started running games. I was playing in like three, four games a week. <laughs> uh, I was just giving myself the full experience that I missed out in childhood because you know when you're young. You know, I grew up in a town of 2,500 people. I lived eight miles outside of town. I'm I'm having like epic scale GI Joe battles by myself in the creek. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like there's no one to play D and D with. Right. Like, <laughs> what, what is the internet? We don't even have cable. Uh, so you know, it, I'm making up for lost time. And what What are your favorite? Uh, what are your favorite like characters to play? Like you're. Uh, I'm a. I'm a night nerd, dude. I love, you know, the old school night stuff, chivalry. Um, you know, I always play a paladin usually. Yeah. He's the best of both worlds. You like an Oath Paladin, a Vengeance Paladin. A... Protector. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, he's got a little bit of magic and, and yeah. you know, righteous power, you know, as well. I always love the paladin character. I'd say like Ranger, Hunter is like my second favorite and that extends to like D D, warcraft you name it it's always you know aragorn from lord of the rings yeah. one of my favorite archetypes uh that that sort of um character so the, those two always they always get me yeah they always get me. I, I i'm like the forever dm so when i do have the chance to be a player finally like it gets out of control like i, I played a uh a tiefling hex blade that's like evil nice. it's evil as fuck <laughs> yeah. going the other way no, no paladins yeah when i finally get the chance to play like we're we're going dark it's yeah. gonna be bad yeah yeah Look, all, all all dms and dungeon masters for your audience who not to know they're they're the real heroes because without them and that thankless job no one can play D. yeah and it is a thankless job it really is you get you get like addicted to it though after a while because you're like as a player, you, you know, you're kind of waiting for your turn. There's that wall. Yeah. But when you're the DM, like you're constantly engaged for like four hours, yeah. like managing all yeah. this stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, I enjoy running the games, but it's the prep that kills me. Right. You know, I'm and, attention to details. I want to be ready. So I have right, to spend right, all these right. hours before the hours of playing. And I'm like, this kills me. Like and, this, this is literally a full time yeah, job. Yeah. And, I, yeah. Yeah, and isn't it always fun when you like craft this exquisite campaign and then your characters like go the players go off in left field and they're like, We don't want to play that campaign. We wanna like go see where this boat takes us. And you're like, Yeah, yeah, I, you're you're that I, player, by the way, Dave. I don't know where you this are boat player. Goes. I'm I just want to point that out <laughs> since we're here. Hold out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's always nice to see a dungeon master sweat. It's like shit. That's true. Yeah, yeah so, let's see you drop on the fly for four hours. So. Exactly. <laughs> So, Chad, what other uh, upcoming projects would you like to tell folks out there about? What are you working on? What's coming out next other than, you know, Sniper 10? Uh, yeah, so so one year off uh, just being released, which is a really, really fun departure uh, for the stuff I normally get to do. Sniper 10 will probably be out in the summer. Um, I got a chance to do a really great uh, period piece, highly stylized. Uh, film last summer that I've had to keep kind of under wraps as they as they go through post production, and so I'm gonna you know tease like a little bit of an announcement of what that project was. Okay. Uh, probably on the on the 20th, just through social media and stuff, can give a first look of costumes and everything else too. And this director and these producers spared no expense, and it's a really inspiring tale. And I don't often get to do period pieces, and this is set in the 60s, so. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I'm lining up some some Comic Con convention appearances, which are, you know, for me the best of all worlds because yeah. I get to go there as a fan and I get to go there to meet people who, you know, love to play Call of Duty or love to check the sniper movies or whatever. So it's really those are always a blast to attend and appear at as well. So, and I'm signing on to a movie that of course I can't really talk about uh, for for March. So, <laughs> so that's that's about all I can say and not say about the things i can't say anything about all right good for you man i mean well, but you're keeping busy that's awesome yeah we'll see you in october if you're coming to comic-con new york i've never been and my family all moved down to south carolina uh in the last couple of years so it, it's like harder and harder to get to to new york state because i used to go at least once or twice a year um but new york comic-con i've never been i heard it's a blast uh i i would love the opportunity to go out there but you know what i have passport will travel to any comic con in in the world 
because I just think they're the absolute best. Well, yeah, if you come through New York, let us know. We'd love to have you here and uh, drink some scotch and, and bullshit about nerd stuff. We'll 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 duel. We'll, we'll spar. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Swords. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And or just roll dice and let our characters do it. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. playing with the swords. Yeah, we'll do, a, in, uh... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do a. We'll we'll do a one shot. Uh, oh, like a one shot doable on something. It's doable. Yeah. So listen, uh, don't threaten me with a good time. I'll buy a plane <laughs> ticket tomorrow. Yeah. I. Uh, any other anything we missed? No. Right. Did we miss anything? Where can people find you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the socials, um, Instagram and, and Twitter at Collins, Chad M Facebook is just Chad Michael Collins. And, um, I'm trying to do what you're all doing. I'm trying to, to build up my YouTube channel as well. Cool. Um, you know, I, I really, there's nothing I love more than paying it forward. There's nothing I love more than sharing people and or saving them the incredible mistakes and expensive expensive mistakes i've made in my journey as an actor so I'm, I'm trying to put more content out there of gaming you know call of duty when i stream and stuff like that twitch.tv slash chad michael collins i do like to stream call of duty i do try to play with a lot of fans and gamers cool. around the world um so i put some of those clips and highlights up there I'm, I'm not a great player but i am a clown uh and it is a good time so but uh you know putting more stuff in terms of acting lifestyle and and success tips and career stuff for actors so uh youtube is just uh chad collins at youtube chad collins at youtube yeah i mean we'll definitely we'll everybody, everything uh, in the description while you're liking and subscribing to our channel also please like and subscribe to chad's channel yeah, and, will, uh, and, for for the folks who are watching this on youtube we'll put a link down in the description oh that's right yeah hey yeah. i have a question for chad so chad like since like the sniper stuff kind of got like a you know shot in the arm with like netflix and being in the top 10 for so long is Netflix like trying to like pour money into it and like maybe start a TV <laughs> series and like really push it? Are they making it rain? Yeah. Tell you what, I you know, and I, I hate to use the cliche. I love to use the cliches. Whatever. I'm letting them fly. It's above my pay grade. <laughs> as they say. you know, I'm 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 always um, you know, we making another one. Where am I going? And and when? Uh so <laughs> I don't know, but I, I gotta think Netflix is thrilled. You know, this was a new deal. Mm -hmm. that they signed on to and you know in terms of the movies that cost a fortune probably to make and to acquire you know i think ours drawn down to scale is probably the best deal that they have on their slate right now yeah in terms yeah of how well yeah it's, you know, yeah viewed. and you're right like considering how much money they put in it i mean amazon with some of their stuff like <laughs> for for arms race it's yeah it's, but, but some for, of it is hit or miss for the production obviously. cost to be low you know, or lower than some grand epic fantasy that's just horrible and such yeah. and 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 a shame to the original. You can name author. names, Dave. You can name uh, names. <laughs> I feel like you're alluding to something quite specific. <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, I, you know, to to make a fun series, you know, or, or a fun franchise that people enjoy that doesn't require a, a ton of, you know, post production or a ton of VR, not VR, but you know, um, the graphics and things like that. I, I can't imagine how that is a bad deal for them in any way. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it is interesting because it's natural to ask those questions, right? Like you guys have done so, so well, like, why don't they make it bigger, better, more, you know, booms, explosions, give you a bigger budget to play with or whatever else. But it's like, it's not how business people at studios right. think. They think, well, you were able to do it on this little bit. Right. Could you do it a little bit less next time? <laughs> right. Right. Well, yeah. it, it's funny because talking, you know, talking about the relationship to the military in a way, how there's crossover, like in the military, at the end of every quarter, you have to go out and shoot all the excess ammunition oh, you have. The quarterly because forecast. You, because yeah. if you don't shoot it all, then right. your budget gets slashed. So yeah. you spend like a day on the range until everybody's so miserable that you start throwing ammunition into the wood line, you know, into the like the forest next right. to you. So yeah, so I'm I'm sure they're the same thing. They're like, well, you guys are making a great product uh, for yeah. this much money. Why do you need more? Yeah, and you know you can't blame them. You know that's that's good business, I suppose. And 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 somehow some way our the powers that be have have pulled it off. Our producers and directors and everything else too, but. Look, I'm just grateful to keep, you know, mm. doing them as is for as long as we possibly can. It's a great time with great people. And, 
you know, really grateful to Sony and 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 now Netflix for you know putting putting it out there in front of people, and you know that people are putting their butts in the seats, so to speak. So it's just always uh, really really cool and very rewarding to see. Well, it's a fun series, and we we really wish you the best and hope you guys keep going strong, and wish you the best in everything that you're. You know that you do outside of the franchise. Yeah, you know, it's fantastic. Chad, I'm, I'm I'm super happy to see the 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 series kind of like you know connect with a new audience and really blow up like that. It's really cool, man, and and I'm glad that you know you guys are going to be able to keep making these films. I I enjoy the hell out of them. Well, I appreciate it, gentlemen. That's very very kind words, and you know, really, it's it it means much more to me, you know, coming from you know real heroes such as yourselves, you know, and that's 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 a stamp of approval that you always hope to get. That you might not so you know as long as they love you know the movies that we're doing you know and it's it, it's it's always nice to hear the feedback from people who have lived the life uh that they can still find a lot of enjoyment on it knowing full well it's not close to the real deal it's yeah fun. but they're, they're good that's fun. what it's yeah it's like snake eyes <laughs> there, there's nobody out there like snake eyes but gi cool. joe <laughs> is fun as hell right 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 it like it, it's fun you know and that that's all that matters i think when people are watching a show is Am I enjoying myself? Absolutely, absolutely, and and I do think that these, the last bunch of films and the one coming out is, you know, we we really wanted to they they wanted to infuse more fun and more popcorn into it, but take away none of the action, and yeah. so I I think that uh, people will really enjoy this next one coming out this summer. We can't wait, Chad. Thank you again so much for doing this, man. I hope we, maybe we can have you back, uh, you know, after the release of Sniper Fifteen and and do another recap of uh, of the films. <laughs> Uh, you know, we wish you the best, man. And uh, our next episode is going to be uh, on Friday. We're going to have Tim Weiner, a uh, journalist that covers the intelligence community. He's going to be back on the show again, uh, talking about some things that are, you know, contemporary in, the, in his sequel to Legacy of Ashes that he's working on, his sort of seminal history of the CIA. Um, so we will have him on Friday and uh, we'll see all you guys then. So take care out there. Thanks, everybody.